Hey guys, Sarah here. So today I'm going to be going over how to calculate double mutations in anything, but this is specifically corn snakes. Um, I am going to do something a little bit different today because I'm kind of going into territory that is extra complicated. So if you have not watched the previous videos in this series and you're not 100% comfortable with Punnett squares and how to calculate all of that stuff, you definitely want to go back and be comfortable with that first. So I highly recommend you go back and watch those videos. I will link them in a card above for you guys to go back and watch. Uh, so the calculating double G mutations is a little bit more difficult in that um, there's just a couple of extra steps that you have to take before you do the Punnett square, and the Punnett square is going to be larger. Uh, you can do a Punnett square like this that we will do for as many different possible genes that there exists. However, you're going to, that Punnett square is going to exponentially grow in size. And when I say exponentially, I mean it in a literal term. Like it will, it will multiply itself every time that you add another gene on. So for now, we're only going to go over the double mutation uh, or two mutations that uh, are not compatible with each other. We've done two mutations that are compatible with each other in the allelic genes, but this is not going to be that. This is going to be calculating maybe two recessive genes or a dominant gene with a recessive gene. Uh, I will be going over all of that as we go through. So what I'm actually going to do is use J and V for genes one and two, and then X for my placeholder as I've been doing. The reason that I picked J and V is because I don't really represent any specific gene. What I want us to do is calculate the whole Punnett square and then go through and use that Punnett square to um, translate it to different genes that we apply to these. So gene one could be Motley and gene two could be Tessera. Gene one could be uh, Amel and gene two could be Diffuse. Uh, it, it really depends on what you want to apply it to, but we're going to go ahead and just start. So we're going to assume that what we have is a visual JV to a HET JV. That's what we're going to assume for at least the first pairing. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start it up here. So remember the homozygous or the visual, I don't want to say visual, we're just going to go ahead and say homozygous and heterozygous because uh, even though most of the genes in corn snakes are recessive, I don't want to assume that we're working with recessive genes here. So the homozygous is going to be J and V. And remember, if we do that, we have to have two of them because there's two different sides of the DNA and we want that to be on both sides. And if we're going to be breeding a JV, whatever that is, homozygous J, homozygous V, to a heterozygous J, heterozygous V, then we want to then do JX, because J is only going to be on one side here, and then VX, which means V is only going to be on one side here. Sometimes, to make this a little more simple, I will put a dash between these, just because I want to separate them into pairs. Because uh, I want this to be very separate from, from that. I want this JJ to be very separate from, from the VV. And I want this JX to be separate from this VX. So however it makes it easier for you to keep it straight in your mind, but the more genes that we work with, the more it's going to be difficult to separate them. Now this is where a lot of people might make it easier on themselves to, instead of using X, to use the small letter. So use a small letter J instead of an X or a small letter V instead of an X here. I always use X because that's what's easier for me, but if it is easier for you to substitute the X on this J here for a small J and the X on this V here for a small V, feel free to do that. The next thing that we want to do is we want to calculate how each of these could possibly line up on each side and create a Punnett square that represents that. So what I mean by that is um, when these line up in any given baby, the J and the V here could line up. So I'm going to call this uh, J1 and I'm going to call this J2 and then I'm going to call this V1 and this V2 just to kind of separate them. So the options that you have are combining this J with this V, so one to one, 
you have this J with this V, which would be one to two, V2, and then you could put this J with V1 or this J with V2. Uh, I know that that looks complicated, but we're just going to write it out. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just put here J1. I'll go ahead and put the ones and the twos here just for you guys in the first one, but we're not gonna do that in all of them. So J1 could be with V1. J1 could also be with V2. So J1 with V2. And then J2 could be with V1. So you could say J2, V1. And then J2 could also be with V2. So J2 and V2. Um, we're not gonna keep the ones and the twos there. That's just so you guys can understand how these would line up. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and do the same for this one, but instead we're gonna go down this way because this represents one parent up top and then something else would represent the other parent on the bottom or not on the bottom, on the side. So uh, we're gonna do the same thing, but instead we're gonna line up that J with that V. So we have J lining up with V, and or we have J lining up with X. So J could line up with X. And then this X could line up with V. So we could do X, V. And then this X could line up with that X. So then we have X, X. Gotta make sure that that looks like an X. Okay, so here we have laid out the basics for our Punnett square. And I'm gonna go ahead and make the square. This is definitely more of a rectangle and the bigger you get, the more of a rectangle it's going to be. And you wanna separate between each of these. And remember when I said that it gets exponentially larger, instead of having four squares this time, we are going to have 16 squares. And I know that they're rectangles and they're a little weird, but just go with it. So I'm gonna go ahead and erase our ones and twos up here because we don't need them and I don't want to add too much stuff to confuse you guys because it's already confusing enough. So we're gonna go ahead and fill this Punnett square out like we would fill out any other Punnett square. We're going to take these going down and then we're gonna take these going across. So uh, all of these are gonna have JV going down because all of them are JV. So I'm gonna, and that's because if you'll remember, this parent was homozygous for J and V. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put JV all the way down here, JV. And then over here. I'm sorry that this is taking kind of long, you guys, but I wanted to go ahead and do it in front of you so you guys could have a pen and paper out doing it with me and following along uh, because it, this is a very complicated one. And it, um, if you can get this, you can get pretty much everything we're gonna do in the future. So it's really important that you guys kind of understand how we're doing this. So that's why I wanted to just go ahead and fill everything out while I'm in front of you guys. Okay, this JV is gonna go ahead and go all the way across. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do that too. JV, JV, and I know that this seems like, hey, we're, Writing the same thing over and over again. What's going on? Don't worry, it gets better. So uh, here, this is JX instead of JV. So we're gonna take this JX all the way around. JX, JX. And then this is XV, so we're gonna go ahead and do that. XV, XV. And then this is XX, so we're taking that XX over. Okay, now I know you might be thinking, this just looks like a weird jumbled up, like all these letters are all over the place. What do any of them mean? Well, if you'll notice, everything in the first row is all the same, and then everything in the second is the same, and the third and the fourth. This is only really the case when you have something like this, when you have a breeding like this, but, uh, and we'll get to more complicated ones after this, but, um, this is probably the most simple version of this type of Punnett square you're gonna see. So all of these here are JV, JV. And I'm just gonna go and write that out. And then all of these, here we'll do the arrow going the other way. All of these are JX, JV, JX, JV. These are all X, V, J, V. And then these are all X, X, J, V. Okay, again, you may be wondering what the heck are all these letters supposed to do? What are they supposed to be? 
Well, if you'll remember, you can put a dash between each pair to sort of separate the different sides, but in this case, you don't necessarily have to since it's so simple, but it does give you an idea of the different sides of the DNA on these offspring. So we have one quarter of the offspring that are the JVJV, JV. one quarter of them are the JXJV, one quarter of them are the XVJV, and then one quarter of them are XXJV. And what all of that means, if you line it up, you can rearrange these to look like the parents, if you want. And I'm going to go ahead and do that because, to me, that makes it a little simpler. So we have two J's that line up up here. So I'm going to go ahead and put those two J's next to each other. We also have two V's in the same one. So I'm going to go ahead and put those V's next to each other. And what do we have? We have a homozygous J and a homozygous V, just like this parent up here. And remember, it doesn't really matter what order these are in. I've mentioned that a few times in past videos, but I want to emphasize it here. It doesn't matter too much what order these are in, at least after you finish your Punnett square, as long as you can order them in a way that makes sense to you. Uh, and in my mind, it makes a lot more sense to go ahead and line up similar letters. So once you get all of your results, you can line up similar letters next to each other to figure out what you have, except for the case of the X's, and we will get to that. So here we have the JJ and the XV. So JJ can line up next to each other. And XV, I'm going to I'm going to make it VX instead, because then we know we have something that is het for V, and then the X is just a placeholder. Now this is where a lot of people would rather use their small letter instead of their instead of an X, because the X can be confused for the other X's, the other placeholders. That can make it confusing, um, but. The way that I have done things, it does make it easier for me to pair a placeholder with something than it is to try to keep track of um, what a small v is and what a large v is versus a small p and a large p or a small s and a large s because all of those look so similar and especially when I'm writing out like this, x's are just easier for me. But if you're typing it out or if you're writing it out, it is easier for you to a small letter in place of the x, feel free to do that like I said. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do the next one. We have um, two V's together this time, so I'm going to go ahead and put the two V's together, and then the ones that are left over are J and X, so J, X, and here we have opposites. So here we had a homozygous J that was het for V. Here we have a homozygous V that's het for J, and over here we're going to go ahead and pair an X with each J and V because they don't have another similar letter to be paired with. So I'm just going to say JX and VX. And as you notice, this parent is the same as this parent, and then this parent is the same as this parent. I'm sorry, this baby and that parent, if that makes sense. So again, you're probably wondering, what does all of this mean? Well, if you apply the two different genes that you're working with, as long as they're not allelic to each other, you can calculate any two genes uh, in corn snakes that are out there pretty much. I did go ahead and write on the board the dominant gene list, incomplete dominant genes, and then the recessive genes. I didn't write down the recessive allelic genes. Uh, I will link that video in a card above if you guys want to go look at that. Um, that one along with the motley and stripe uh, is a little complicated, but and I didn't want to like write out every single gene on the board. I just wanted to kind of give you guys a reminder of which genes do what. So. I'm going to do three different examples with this that we've laid out here and apply those genes to this. So the different examples that I'm going to do are I'm going to pair a recessive gene with an incomplete dominant, I'm going to pair a recessive gene to a dominant, and I'm going to pair an incomplete dominant with a dominant. Just so you guys can get an idea of how this Punnett square could apply to pretty much anything that you're going to do. Uh, maybe I'll go ahead and do four or more, just, just so you guys can also do like recessive with each other. So um, let's just say for the sake of argument that J is AML, since we're here. J is going to be AML, and V is going to be Annery. That's two recessive genes. I know I said I was going to start with other things, but we're going to start with two recessives. If J is AML and V is Annery, 
then what we have up here is a snow to a het snow. And the babies that come out are, here this is one set, one quarter snow, we have one quarter amel, het for annery, we have one quarter annery, het for amel, and we have one quarter normals that are het for amel and annery. So that's how you would interpret that if you were breeding two recessive genes together. Now let's just say instead of annery, that one is a tessera. This one is a little bit weirder because tessera is a dominant gene, but we'll just read through it. So if J is an amel and V is a tessera, here we have an amel tessera that's homozygous tessera. And here we would have an amel that's heterozygous tessera, which means it would be a visual tessera, but it's a heterozygous tessera. So if you bred that to a normal, you would get half tesseras and half non tesseras statistically. Uh, here you're going to have a homozygous tessera that's het for amel. And then down here you're going to have a het tessera, het amel. And remember, the het tessera is going to be visual tessera in this case. Uh, so let's try a different one. Let's go ahead and try a, uh, an incomplete dominant gene. So let's try tessera with palmetto. So let's say that the J's are P's and the V's are T's. <laughs> I know this is not confusing at all, right? Uh, so with that case, this is going to be again a homozygous tessera and homozygous palmetto. So as you guys know, homozygous palmettos are completely white with little speckles of color on them. Uh, the next one that we would have is again a homozygous palmetto and a heterozygous tessera. And these are both going to visually be tessera, like I said, and visually palmetto, the pretty white snakes. Uh, but it's, it's only a het tessera, so not all of its offspring are always going to be tesseras. Uh, here we are going to have a homozygous tessera with a heterozygous palmetto. Now this one is going to look sort of like a hypo tessera because palmetto in a het form kind of looks like a hypo. And then down here we again have the heterozygous palmetto with the heterozygous tessera. Again, this is going to be a visual tessera, and it's going to look kind of hypo because of the palmetto. Uh, let's see, what if we mess around with palmetto, and we go ahead and add annery back in here. So if we have like palmetto and annery, uh, if J is palmetto, we have our homozygous palmetto with our homozygous annery. So this is just going to be an annery palmetto over here if we do that. Uh, this one here, again, is going to be our homozygous palmetto, but it's het annery. So it's going to look like a normal palmetto and just carry the annery gene. This one here is going to be a homozygous annery and het palmetto. Now remember, a het palmetto makes it a hypo-ish looking type. So this is going to look a little bit more like a ghost. It's going to be uh, visually annery, but it's going to look a little ghostish because of the het palmetto. And then this last one down here is het palmetto, het annery. So it will just sort of look like a hypo. Um, you can kind of play with this with different genes that you're working with, whether you're working with buff or toffee or mask, um, or if you're working with diffuse or, or anything in here that you're working with. Uh, you can even do diffused and mask, which is actually a really common one. We'll just go through that because that's gonna be interesting. Uh, we'll just say J is diffused and the V is mask here. So if the J is diffused, here you have a homozygous diffused and a homozygous mask. So you're going to get a really, really nice blood red that has the really high expression mask. It may not have any head pattern at all. And uh, it's gonna have like really, uh, really good like diffusion and no checkers on the belly. Uh, here, you're gonna have your diffused het mask. So it's still gonna be a blood red, but it's not gonna be quite as like clean colored. Uh, you're still not gonna have any belly checkers. Uh, it's gonna be a nice, it's a nice, it's gonna be a nice blood red, but it's not going to be like the ideal with the homozygous mask. Uh, here, you have the opposite. You have a homozygous mask, but a het diffused. So uh, this is actually really, really common. We see a lot of masks that are head diffused that really, really look like they're homozygous diffused when they're not. I just did a video on mask. I will link that in a card above if you guys wanna go watch that. It shows the visual differences between homozygous and heterozygous masks. But this is gonna be your homozygous mask that is het diffused even though um, it itself is not diffused. Might have a few belly checkers, but it'll still have that nice like 
a mask head pattern to it. And the last one here is Het Diffuse Het Mask. So it's going to be a sort of lower expression mask. It carries the diffuse gene, but it doesn't show it. So that's just sort of an overall how to do the double genes when you have a double homozygous to a double heterozygous. I'm going to do future videos on like when you have a, um, a heterozygous to a, um, a homozygous, like if it's, if it's like, let's say this was, uh, let's say this was an X here, like what do we do? If, if this V was not homozygous and instead it was heterozygous, how does that change all of these things? We'll go through those in a future video. This video is very long already, but I wanted to get you guys started on some of the very basics of calculating the double gene mutations. I hope it helped you. If anything was vague, please let me know in the comments. I will try to clear it up in a future video. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.